So, so my name is Whip Lamb. I'm a psychiatrist who mainly works with people who use uh, drugs. And uh, I'm Jean-Paul Michael. I'm a community case manager. I work for an inner city hospital in Toronto. And today we're going to talk a bit about a core content material, like for intro to addiction care or substance use care, on a topic called contingency management. And the reason that we're talking about it is because uh, either on a podcast or a conversation, you're like, shouldn't we talk about that? Should we talk about contingency management? Isn't it important? Like we tried to do it. Did it work? Did it not work? So just tell me a bit about what makes you interested in this uh, topic. Well, you know, so anything in, anything in this addiction world that has some evidence based to it, um, I sort of jump on, right? Because it's like there's so much kind of non-evidence based stuff around in this world or stuff that's not been fully studied not like stuff that might work but might work yeah but, but it's not been fully studied so and uh just from my own personal journey as somebody who uh you know traveled through uh, uh through the stimulant world personally um i know it's one of the uh, few areas uh, few tools in the toolbox that has some yeah. evidence in for yeah. stimulants yeah it's got the most evidence yeah. right so that's why that I, my initial interest in it um, I've uh, never seen it uh, done in person in a place where I've practiced uh, uh, with, 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 with one exception, and, and that, that exception is in my house. So, um, so I uh, used uh, contingency management on, um, uh, on um, Tim Horton's cards with my partner who was trying to quit smoking. Hmm. And um, it uh, was a fascinating experience. Um, so you have a bit of involvement in this story because the Tim Hortons cards, I ended up, I had, I, I so here's the, the quick version <laughs> of the story. These are your Tim Hortons cards that were for patients, but I, uh, and, and we kept giving them to a patient in the hospital that didn't like Tim Hortons okay. and they wanted to buy uh, uh, cards at the, uh, at the cafeteria. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. I had to keep, uh, I, I would buy the buy the Tim Hortons cards and then use the the, the money for that to buy her cafeteria cards. <laughs> so uh, oh, so then I, I got stuck with a bunch of, of, of five dollars oh, Tim Hortons cards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I decided to put them to use and uh, say, okay, well, you know, if you want to, um, so you want to quit smoking. So you know, every uh, I don't I don't know it was I don't quite remember all the mechanics of it, but it was like for you know every day you you quit as somebody you know or smoke less or like less yeah yeah yeah. so it would be like i'll give you one card and then if you hit two days i'll give you two cards and you three days i'll give you three cards but the irony of this whole thing is that uh he doesn't like tim hortons at all either oh okay 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 but there was just some magic (laughs) that 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 lit up on yeah, this, yeah, yeah, this yeah, guy yeah. who's been smoking for 10 years, <laughs> yeah, 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 right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, quit, yeah, tried yeah, many, yeah, many yeah, times yeah, unsuccessfully. Yeah, that yeah, just, yeah. just sort of like, what? I'm going to get five cards? <laughs> <laughs> five cards that I will never use and never spend because I don't like their coffee or <laughs> but, their food. <laughs> but I want these cards. And yeah. I'm here for my cards. Yeah. And it's like, um, you know, and it's just, it was just this thing that lit up, right? And yeah. it was just, it was just so fascinating. And, um, Look, you know, uh, there, I think there was one, one, he, he, he failed once and we started again. Yep. Yeah. And, um, and, and, but by the time, you know, we hit uh, day 12, um, he'd quit smoking, you know, so, and so he has 12 stopped. days of 12 days. cards. So the person didn't use a patch, gum, inhaler, varenicline. Nothing. Propion, no Nothing. hypnosis. You didn't do any hypnosis. I did not. No. So you just uh, basically had these rewards that the person doesn't actually use or want, but the whole idea of getting something was rewarding enough. That's a fantastic example, you know. Yeah. And and I think it it segues nicely into the topic we're going to uh, talk about, right? Because for the patient you were seeing, they wanted real food from the cafeteria. Yes. The Tim Hortons card had no value, Correct. but but the cafeteria food did. Yes, right. So so this is this is great. So contingency management. Uh, maybe maybe I'll tell some stories too. Please, maybe I'll tell some stories too. So in a previous podcast, I talked about Nathan Azrin, yes. and he talked about how he toilet trained 
uh, adults, uh, right. you know, with developmental disabilities. Uh, and, and I shared a bit uh, with my uh, kids uh, when I toilet trained them. That's what I, I did the same same approach as is toilet training in like five hours or something. I think it took me like five weeks or longer. But basically it involves having like jelly beans or jujubes and you break down the steps into every component. You walk to the body, you put your pants down, you take your diaper down, you sit on the potty, something comes out, maybe it doesn't, but even if it doesn't, when they get up. So every single small step, you can give them a jelly bean until they learn it and uh, have it. And when they don't do it, you withhold and uh, take away the, the jelly bean. The other time that I used the thing was, I think I heard it on some podcast, but when um, my, how old were my kids? I don't know if the youngest was like two and a half or three, and then the older one was like four or five, and I couldn't get them to sleep. They would just like scream and yell and this, this, and that. And so we put them in the same room, but then they were just playing with each other and talking and, and all that stuff. And so what I did was I got about 10 little trinkets. Uh, I think one was like a Peppa Pig box with like 10 little uh, toys in it. Uh, and another time I individually wrapped 10 gifts. I had to do it twice, right? I did it once. And then we took a trip where their sleep schedule was all messed up and they came back. It's like six months later and I did it again. And so what I would tell them was that um, if you sleep nicely tonight, I had a rule that they just had to be in their own bed and quiet. Uh, after 8 p.m., uh, you're sleeping uh, quietly and calm. In the morning, you get the treat right away. You get the, the prize right away. Uh, and so then within a week, you know, uh, one time one kid would get it, but then the other one wouldn't. Sometimes they know you both have to be to, for anyone to get a prize. You can't leave anyone behind or whatever, excuse me, weird philosophy I had. But within a week, because they were getting those things, they, all of a sudden they started sleeping quietly, no problem. You know, and uh, it was really just that that small token sort of gift. Sometimes it was like a small car. It was Peppa Pig. One of the kids didn't even like Peppa Pig, but they still got excited about the uh, car uh, component uh, to it. Uh, and, and with the contingency management, really what you're thinking is about there's this antecedent behavior and uh, reward. The same thing that you would uh, get, uh, look at when you're doing CRA or any kind of behavioral approach, but you're adding another reward to it. And um, yeah, and maybe I'll just cover some of the basic principles. Sure. This is the, the book from the late, great Nancy Petrie, P-E-T-R-Y. And she's a phenomenal um, psychologist and a phenomenal scientist. Uh, and she did this book that walks you through everything related to contingency management. It covers the philosophical principles, the psychological principles. It uh, covers... Um, the steps to how to design, how to pick what the reinforcer is, how to pick the patient population. It also has a way to create a business plan, what to present to your manager, how to track uh, outcomes and stuff. Because with all this stuff, you can't just start yelling into the air, we need contingency management. You actually have to find a way to work with leadership to sort of create and build and put this. And this together. is more from the lens of if you're you know, in a hospital trying to advocate for this type of program, how you'd get funding, that sort of thing. Yeah, even uh, if you're in a family practice, even if right. you have a smaller clinic, uh, that's that's there. Uh, she mainly uh, worked uh, in the. There are uh, some elements to this that might be useful for for uh, a mom who's trying to, to help their, uh, you know, their kid in something too, right? So there's there's, there's yeah. lessons from this that are. There's there's lessons for the partner that's just trying to get her husband to put the dishes yeah. away. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They're, they're absolutely uh, absolutely yes, and uh, it's really when you start thinking about behavior and uh, shaping. Um, okay. Uh, behavior. So, so I have a couple of notes uh, as well, just because I want to make sure I don't miss anything. But today I am going to talk about the key elements of reward within a contingency management paradigm. I'm going to list examples of effective uh, interventions that can improve uh, two things. One would be attendance at uh, meetings, and the other thing would be drug abstinence. And then the hope would be that after listening to this, people who are attending can seek out this book, seek out other resources yeah. if they want to implement it um, uh, locally. And, and the key concept really is around this whole, there's this antecedent behavior reward uh, where there's some kind of a trigger, then the person sort of does something, and then there's some kind of short-term reward that they might uh, get. And you want to change the behavior so you have the same trigger, same reward, different uh, behavior, and uh, it works better if you do it in a social uh, context. Does that make sense? It makes sense. So for contingency management, for the reinforcement piece, there's three th key things you need to think about. One is that the award has to have the appropriate magnitude 
for tangible reinforcement. Uh, it has to be provided every time the behavior is observed and you need to have appropriate timing. So you have to avoid the long delay, right? And so uh, for for me, I had to have a, a toy that the kids cared about uh, enough. Yeah. You know, uh, I had to... Um, give it every time that they had a good night's sleep. So I couldn't just give it at the end of the week. That They're not going to remember. I'd have to do it every day. And part of me was struggling with, do I do it every evening? Like at 9 p.m. if they're quiet, do I give it to them then? And then I take it away if they, they don't. Uh, and um, yeah, so you have to get it. And yeah, we need the appropriate timing for it as well. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Yep. Okay. So with contingency management, there's the positive reinforcement, which could be the toy, it could be the Tim Hartons gift card, it could be a pat on the back, it could be a hug, it could be thank you, I appreciate you. Then there's also the comment of negative reinforcement. And this is where I always get confused. You negative, what do you think? What do you think? Are you hitting them? Or no, no. You just, negative reinforcement is withholding the reward. Right. The person doesn't get a Tim's card. The person does not get that Peppa Pig toy right. at the top of their desk and so forth. Where this has been used, this has been used in uh, different kinds of behavior therapies before where they're trying to shape behavior. It was used in Azrin's token economy that he developed for uh, schizophrenia. Um, the challenge is that it really tends to work more in closed environments. So what that means is that when you have a connection out to the world where you have unlimited Tim Hortons cards or unlimited toys or unlimited finances, it's hard to find that value in that, that card. But if it's a closed environment, you know, just like you see sometimes in jail where everything has value, like jujubes have value, coffee has value, this has value, that's where it tends to be a little bit more um, more effective. And, and you do see it in a lot of outpatient settings as well, right? So what happens when you go to AA? Sometimes people clap and cheer when you've been sober for a little a while. Sometimes there'll be coffee and food there as well. And all this counts as a, a contingency and a reward of some kind. The whole idea with contingency management is that it's the application of a tangible positive reinforcers to change behavior and specifically substance use behavior. Okay. You have specific items that you give people in the context of reward. And in order to implement it, you do have to frequently monitor the behavior you're trying to change. So it could be you're in drug screen. It could be like smelling your partner's breath. Like, do they smell like smoke or not? Uh, it could be like other things uh, as well there. And, and when the behavior doesn't occur, you don't give them that reward. Okay. Where it's been done, it's been done a lot in the methadone clinics in the 60s. They use it with a lot of uh, take-home doses for um, uh, methadone, you know, in terms of giving people more carries and stuff. Uh, one of yeah, the, absolutely. Uh, so a, a take-home dose of methadone clearly is contingency management. Yeah. Right? You've got to meet these, these, these milestones. Um, uh, you know, to, 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 to reach that. And then when you've got that, you've, you've got this reward of this freedom of, I don't need to go to the pharmacy every day. Now I got to go every three days or, or, or ultimately I guess once a week, sometimes once every two weeks. That's exactly when you've it. been yeah. going every day for that's the last, exactly like, you know, five years of your life at 11 AM every morning, you've had to go to the pharmacy. So that's a huge reward, but maybe not quite as attain. It's, it's, it's more of a long term thing, right? Cause it's, there's not these little, I guess, mini thresholds as you get one day carries, right, I guess. But it's still a long road for that. Yeah, it's, it's a long road and, uh, you know, it's a bit... No uh, jelly punitive. beans. Uh, no, no, no jelly beans on the, on the event of, of just pulling your diaper down. Yeah, yeah. No, there's sometimes a little bit more of expectations. And, and it's hard to know which contingencies are more sort of evidence-based. And it also gets tricky because each individual is uh, different. But usually after like three weeks to a month of uh, having urines that do not have uh, other uh, opiates in it, then you start to get one carry, then you start to get two, then yep. you start to get three. And, and the reason that uh, people are so rigid about it, uh, one is that you, you do want to keep improving behavior. You want to give some kind of carrot. But the other thing is that the risk of diversion is uh, so high, yeah. right? And so uh, say if I'm only using three Percocets a day and I get somebody's methadone dose, I could die with one uh, dosage and and sadly you know i've had patients where that's the case where um uh they may be on a low dose opiates for for pain and then they trade it for some diverted methadone and then they they just don't um they don't make it right but the um but it has been used in the uh methadone clinics as well uh some places have studied these uh, voucher like uh, systems uh you know so uh the people will be part of a study it'll be an eight-week trial where uh, every uh week of sobriety or clear urines, you start to get these vouchers and it grows exponentially, right? And so uh, you could get maybe $20 for the first week, maybe $100 for the second week. It gets to the point at the end of eight weeks where you can like buy an iPod or an iPad, yeah. iPod, whatever, whatever it sort of uh, might uh, might be. 
Uh, and the part that's actually shown the most uh, benefit uh, actually has to do with the um, fishbowl, yes. right? So you, you may have seen before. Yeah, you get a, you get a, you get a, a raffle of go putting your hand in the fishbowl, and yep. and uh, I think you everyone wins something. Uh, yes, but the the big prize is 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 an opportunity to get that big prize where there's like one out of fifty or something. Yeah. Yeah, and so what, what you do with it is uh, when people come in the first visit and you have that group session, it's exactly what you said. Everyone draws until they win something. Yep. And you do it in the first five or ten minutes. So you condition them to coming in. They get to draw. They sort yep. of get that prize. Uh, and then they put it back. And everybody wins the first time. And then subsequently, uh, depending on uh, if you decide urines are the marker or something else is the marker, uh, you start to uh, elevate the, the prize god, how many times you get to pick uh, before you get it and uh, so forth. Does that make sense? Yep, it makes sense. Okay, so the voucher system, uh, there's been a lot of studies by Stephen Higgins, who's at the University of Vermont, and there they have voucher-based procedures to integrate token economy into outpatient uh, substance use, and that's where they get points. They get points for every negative urine, uh, and the longer you're sober, the more points you get, and it goes pretty much from coffee to uh, clothes to an iPod. And uh, it, it does get quite expensive because... Uh, over 12 weeks, if the person's been able to maintain sobriety, they had, this is back when they did the studies, I think it was like in the 80s or something, they would get about $1,000, right, uh, for it, which is, which is not a small... That's a, that's um, a lot of money. Yeah, not a small amount, although who knows what, what it'll be in a few years. Um, when they compared the um, uh, voucher contingency management plus CRA to the 12 step, uh, it was a little bit uh, uh, better uh, than, uh, than that. Uh, and uh, they found that about 85% of people with contingency management versus about one-third of people in 12 steps stayed in treatment uh, for longer, and a higher percentage in contingency management stayed abstinence as well. Now, just putting my 12-step lens on for a moment, not to uh, be the wet blanket on this, but a lot of this doesn't seem very uh, very harm reduction oriented. Well, in a, maybe a way, in a way, principally it's harm reduction, but you know, even rewarding based on UDSs or like, I mean, a lot of this seems. No, and that's why that's why I think it's so important to frame it as this is work that was done and it was studied and then the behavior changed. And so philosophically, I think, you know, we have to eventually decide what's important for right. us. You know, okay. is it important for us to sort of decide the goals and shift it? Is important to co-develop the goals? I suspect ideally what we'd want is we'd want to meet them where they're at. Yeah. And if they want to cut down on stuff, offer them this program as opposed to making everybody go through a contingency management program to stop the substance use. Right. And so I guess that I, I guess that even in even in my smoking example, in, in, in the way that I didn't structure it in a harm reduction way, I structured it in a manner that was to focus on eliminating smoking because there really yeah. wasn't much reward. It, it, there wasn't a, a halfway step yeah. of if you smoked yeah. half you know, there would be a reward, which probably you could have done it in that manner. No, no, you too. could have done it, but, but what you did was effective, so you didn't have to change it. But if what you did wasn't effective, yeah. you'd have to maybe find a middle ground reward. Yeah. You might have to find a different prize. You might have to uh, give the prize every three hours, right. right, where the person could resist, right? But but it worked, so you didn't yeah. have to. But that's why just basic principles are key for this right. stuff. So we're not necessarily advocating for this in every situation, but we're certainly, we're just talking about it as, as, as just another modality of therapy that exists or of treatment. Yeah, and, and why not why not offer it? Like, I mean, obviously with uh, methadone, it's a bit of a coercion where we're forcing people to do it. Uh, you could argue that if you have a stimulant use program, you're forcing people to do that as well. But I think if you're looking for behavior change, if you get the person to say that, hey, I want my life to be healthier, why not include this as one of the uh, the options? Absolutely, yeah, if, if that's meeting the patient where they're at, as you said, right? Mm -hmm.